So I was born in Cherry Creek, South Dakota, um, on the Cheyenne River Reservation. I moved to Dupree um, when I was in Head Start, beginning Head Start. Um, we lived there until um, before I started third grade, and then we moved to Rapid City um, for my father to receive medical care um, in Rapid. <clears throat> um, when I was growing up, um, I did various things, um, you know, wanted to be a nurse, wanted to do all types of sorts of things. And then when I um, lived in Eagle Butte, because um, that's where I graduated from, and then we came to Rapid and I knew I needed to go back to school and they had the Oglala Lakota College there. Um, and it's actually named after my grandfather. Um, it's the Sydney Keith um, Hisapa building. And so I felt that connection. Um, and so I started school there and went into education from previously being a paraprofessional in the Eagle Butte School District as well as Rep City Area School District. And that's where I found my, my passion for the educational setting and the students that they serve. And so going on and going to school for education was like an easy fit for me. Um, and so I started school at OLC, took my classes, stayed committed, and then started working for the Rapid City Area School District right after graduation. So I think my journey as an educator has changed. Um, when I first went into education, um, it was from moving to Rapid City in the third grade, I struggled. I struggled with um, my environment. I struggled in school. Um, I wanted to go home. I wanted to go back to the, to the reservation, um, you know, my comfort zone, home. And so um, when I first initially went into education, I wanted to be that person that I needed. Um, and that's why I am in third grade. We have a lot of our indigenous students that transfer back and forth from reservation to Rapid City. Um, so I wanna be that person for them. I wanna be able to advocate for them and be there. And so that was initially you know, who I wanted to be. And then I got into the classroom and I wanted, I really looked at what my experience was in school and I changed it. Um, you know, as we spoke before, a lot of changes in what I seen, um, you know, what we what we did in the classrooms and stuff didn't fit with who I was. So I changed it. My classroom is very much um, the pictures are on the wall or native prints. Um, we have a buffalo skull um, hanging up on the wall. We have the the medicine wheel on our carpet for our, um, you know, Teoshbe time. So I incorporated a lot of um, native influences into my classroom. A, a while ago, I had read a, um, an interview that my grandma, Lucy Swan, High Pine Swan had um, done, and she talks about the boarding schools. And there's just one sentence in there that really stuck with me. And this was probably six, seven years ago that I happened to run across this, this interview. And it talks about the boarding schools and how she misses or she longed to speak the Lakota language. And so that piece of it has really stuck with me. And my idea or my thought process on it was there was not going to be a Native student that ever says, I wish I could have spoke my language. Like, I am going to keep that door open for them to learn and experience and you know, be able to speak fluently their language in the classroom. So along with school, my grandmother, Madonna, um, Abdella Swan, so she ended up with tuberculosis. She went to school and didn't earn enough credits to be, um, to graduate, but she was a Head Start teacher. She later became um, the Native American Woman of the Year. And I've always thought that these women, so my grandma Lucy went to school, um, by the time she was 18, she made it to the seventh grade. My father actually went to school until he was in the seventh grade um, and then had, was forced to, um, 
to quit school and work for the family and, um, you know, farming and ranching and stuff. So the importance of education was that tone was already set within my family, you know, and I think about, so I graduated with my edu- ed specialist degree and I, I contribute that to my grandma. Like I was going to finish that for her because she never had the chance to um, before tu- tuberculosis and her health had taken over. And so like I was, it, it was instilled in me a long time and I didn't even realize it, you know, or pay attention to it um, throughout the years as I was growing up. And it just became important to me now, you know, or throughout the years. <laughs> the landscape of Native um, education um, continues to change. The OICU, the Ocheri Shakui Essential Understandings were created um, to help educators um, with the incorporation and understanding of set standards like um, land, um, um, policies, uh, language, all of these different things. So they're, um, they were created to give them a starting point of this is what a lesson should connect to. And they were created by elders, they were created by indigenous educators, they were created by community members. So these people got together and and formed a focus on what um, native and non-native students should should be learning. So the OICUs um, are, um, provided by the State Department of Education, but they're not mandated by the state or mandated by the district. So teachers have an option or districts have an option to, um, to teach them, essentially. Um, I think at this point in time, um, they are necessary. You know, we know that culture saves lives that connection for so long we have done without the Ocheri Shaku essential understandings. Those standards actually, um, I believe it was 2008 or something is when those st- standards started, the work on them started coming up. And then in 2011, the, um, the standards had came out. So, I mean, we're talking years and years for not them not to be implemented. And we, when we say, you know, we teach all students, what does that look like? Um, a, you know, a lot of times I, I always hear Native students have the lowest graduation rate. Well, we're continuing to do the same thing and expect different results. So why don't we try something different? Go with these standards that have been established, implement them into our classrooms and see if that works, you know. Um, I see districts across the state that there's one or two classrooms, there's, you know, a certain grade level. Um, General Beadle is actually doing an amazing job right now of the implementation of those. Um, And when I say the changes, you know, with people that sit, you know, in these positions that, that are in charge of the change, that are in charge of these policies that can put things in place. OSCU lead now for the district. Um, we have OSCU champions that are in each of the schools that work with teachers on the implementation of these standards. Last year, working with Region 11, um, I was part of a pilot program, and I took one teacher from each grade level, and then we met. So, I mean, you can imagine what the OSCU implementation in our school looks like right now. But putting these the certain things in place and then allowing that the, the lead teacher or the champion or whatever you want to call them, get those OSCUs out, offer support, offer resources to these teachers. One of the things that, that teachers have a hard time with, too, is time, you know, and, and just like you and I had discussed, time is something that, that we're always fighting for, you know, more time. And teachers need to understand the OSCUs are to be incorporated into their lessons. They're not a standalone lesson. You don't have to make time to, oh, I need to teach an OSCU lesson today. No, it should be incorporated into your reading lesson. It should be incorporated into your math lesson. And it can be incorporated in different ways. 
Um, right now, we're focused on language in my classroom, you know, um, so I can incorporate that into math. Um, we incorporate that into, you know, our reading lessons, um, <clears throat> talking about bear, you know, motto, um, adding that language within whatever it is that I'm teaching. In the educational system, let's implement these, let's put these in place for the understanding of all people and then see what happens. You know, I, the, I can only think that it could be only get better. It can't get any worse. Look at where we're at now. So why not try it? And I think that's one of the things that I, I want to say to teachers, you know, since they're not going to mandate them at the state level, since your district's not going to mandate them, I need you to come with, with everything you have and put it into this OSCU. So let's try it, you know. And I say that to teachers all the time, just try it. What could it hurt? You know, it could only bring, and I know that by experience, how I've incorporated them into my classroom, what my classroom looks like. Behavior-wise, I know that's something across the nation that everybody's struggling with is behaviors. Let's allow these students to have that connection with themselves. Let's allow them to see themselves in the classroom. You know, I talk about how I have native prints, I have a buffalo skull, they see themselves in my classroom. They're not outsiders, you know? They come in, they're home, this is family. They have that connection, that burden that they feel is lifted when they walk through my door. And then that gives them the, the opportunity to learn. If we continue allowing them to carry that burden on, they're never going to. They're not gonna feel safe, they're not gonna feel open enough to open them themselves up to learning. So the Winter Wachipi was um, first established last year um, and working with the Region 11 Department of Education, um, Tribal Relations, they had created um, a teacher's guide. So within the teacher's guide, one of the opponent components was um, um, actively participating in an event in the community, um, such things as a powwow, hand game, something like that. So I really wanted to create something for um, the staff and students at Rapid City Area Schools where they were able to connect with the community at a cultural event and actively participate. So that's how that idea came about. Um, and we had our uh, first Wichipi last year in December. Um, we had to face a snowstorm. <laughs> and so this year, um, you know, we come back with better ideas. Um, some of the things that didn't work very well last year, you know, we wanted to try and correct them from this year. Um, this Wichipi has over 100 plus people that um, donate in some type of way. Um, like our secretaries have, um, uh, she had made the flyer for it. Another secretary had helped me yesterday with our raffle. We have a raffle going on um, on Give Butter. And some of the raffle items even are donated. Um, one was um, donated by our custodial staff, a, a star quilt. Um, we have a buffalo skull that was donated by Dan O'Brien. Um, we have a student that's painting that buffalo skull. That will be in the raffle. Um, we have a teacher um, be making a jingle dress. So there's so many components to this Wachipi. Um, you know, when we put this on in, I mean, the outpour of help through it, through our Indian Education Office, um, you know, our principal, um, Abby Karn, you know, has a lot of influence in it. So everybody has their part, volunteers. So I'm so excited in for staff to come out and be able to dance um, with our students and, and spend that time with them in an environment that, you know, is the students, you know, essentially, and for them to come out and showcase, you know, who they are and have those social dances with their teachers and in the rest of the community and have a good time. We're putting on um, a feed with Hangry Buffalo. 
Uh, we have door prizes, and the door prizes are um, being donated by General Beadle staff. So there will be a lot of door prizes there. Um, you know, a photo booth. Um, I'm just, I'm really excited. Well, in our raffle too, um, all the money that we get from our raffle goes back into the Wachipi, you know, monetary um, gift for the drum group for coming out. Um, some of it may or may not go to, you know, paying for the food. Um, Indian Ed uh, Department this year has graciously paid for our food this year, um, as well as they did last year. So it's just a lot of people coming in. And so that's district, you know, our district is, is 100% behind it and willing to do what they can. Yeah. For after school clubs, they wanted to know, you know, why we didn't have any clubs. Um, parents wanted these clubs as well. And so just really thinking of idea of how we fundraise for these clubs um, came up with uh, the art auction, presented it to our, our building leadership team. They were excited to be a part of it in from there, it has blossomed into something pretty amazing because it is absolutely student-centered. They contribute and donate their art pieces um, for this auction, therefore raises money for them to put on these um, after-school clubs. And I just want to give a shout out to um, the teaching staff at General Beetle too. Uh, last year, I did not have the funding to, um, to pay teachers. And so, um, you know, they were willing to do it. We had book clubs, art clubs, Lego clubs, Lakota drumming, Lakota dancing, um, games. These teachers that came out and um, provided these clubs for our students um, donated their time in, in doing so, you know. And that's one thing that I absolutely, you know, breaks my heart in a way and I'm so proud of in a way because you know they stepped up but I don't ever want somebody to step up um you know without being compensated the way they should teachers give so much of their time and energy and that's just something that's really stuck with me so in creating this art auction I went out and um just started with businesses that I knew you know with all terrain exteriors um, he's the guy who did my roof, um, you know, uh, uh, farmer's insurance, you know, um, she had came out, um, Stephanie had came out and, and donated. What I asked of them was to um, choose a grade level. So kindergarten, first, second, third, and their fourth and fifth. And then they were um, donating to that grade level. Um, so there was three of them, all terrain exteriors, um, uh, farmers insurance, and then Larry Keller and family. So they donated with a, a group of uh, a group of grade levels and then provided the canvases for them. Um, I donated the paint. Um, we got the Dolphin Art Art Center involved from Rapid City. They had um, the Stodder. Uh, her last name is Stodder, an artist, come and teach our students um, watercolor. And they provided the paints, the brushes, the paper for them, and then, you know, the artists. So that was pretty amazing for them, too. And then students created whatever they wanted. So through this, too, what I found is we have so many talented artists uh, within our group of students. And so um, there came the Buffalo School that was donated for a Wachipi raffle, you know, asking the fifth grade students who they would like or who they think would best fit painting that Buffalo School um, so we're able to raffle it. And they chose a student, and she is an amazing artist, you know. So I think all of their talents got to be tapped into and came up with amazing pictures, you know, um, all the way down to kindergarten. Kindergarten students even donated these pictures. So kindergarten through fifth grade, and then we were allowed to have these, these clubs for them after school. I have a lot of all-time highs. Um, you know, we sing a Lakota song when we line up, and just listening to students sing 
Um, that's an all hot time high for me every day. You know, um, when I see a student, um, I had a staff member come up to me and they said, oh, I have to share this with you. So-and-so came up to me today and he said, he honey washed it. I am so glad you're here today. And when I see things that are incorporated in the classroom being done outside of the classroom, that's exciting. That gives me that purpose, that much more purpose to continue doing what I do. Because then that means that it's transferring outside of my classroom into our school, into our community. You know, uh, we always talk about Matakiwe Oyasi. We are all related. So the beginning of the year, that's one of the very first lessons that I teach and that forms that family within my classroom. And outside in the playground, when they see a grasshopper or we had a bad case of the bees this year outside and my students are running around, don't kill it, don't kill it, we're related to them. <laughs> you know, they get this different perspective of, we are the keepers of the trees, of the, the, the grass, of the air, of the water. That's how this gets started, you know? This is how we start taking care of each other and our surroundings and our environment and stuff, you know? And then that opens the door to them. So that part, beyond anything that I've ever done, beyond the Wichipi, beyond um, anything that I could have teacher of the year or anything, it's what those students bring out of that classroom and contribute to society, contribute to their community. One of the things that we talk about all the, all the time is Chante Washte, good heart. My students say all the time, walk with a good heart. I tell them every time they leave my classroom to specials, to lunch, walk with a good heart. They know that me, me, means that the choices that they make need to come from their heart, you know? And yes, they do understand that, you know, people make bad choices, so do I. And I am always the first one to apologize for it. And so they learn that concept even when they go out. And, you know, my homework, I don't send paper home. My homework is help your mother with the dishes today. Maybe help dad cook supper. Pick up your room without being asked. Those are the homeworks. So then they come back to the school and they say, my mom was so proud of me last night, you know, and I'm like, yes, but you're contributing to your household. That is your job, you know? So when they learn the contributions to households, to classrooms, to school environments, to their community. Um, the other thing we learn, you know, the medicine well comes in fours, the four colors, the four seasons. Um, right now, um, our conversations have been um, about um, healing. So when you heal self, you heal family, you heal community, and you heal nation. So what does that look like when I'm really upset, you know, when I'm really mad? How do I conduct myself in a manner that I don't hurt family and I don't hurt community and I don't hurt commu uh, nation? So they're really focusing on that self piece, you know? The advice that I would give to educators is that we need to stop waiting for people um, to tell us to do things, um, you know? And I'm talking about the implementation of the Ocheri Shakti Essential Understandings. Um, we're waiting for somebody to say at our district level or the state level to say, you need to teach these. The, and like I said, these have been here before I even became a classroom teacher, um, but they're not utilized. They are not given the importance that they deserve, you know, go out there and do what they feel is the right thing um, for our students. Uh, every interview that I have done, um, you know, I can come out here and I can prove to you, oh, I know how to speak Lakota. Um, and I, and I took it a different way. There's only one word that I have ever said in Lakota 
in all of the interviews and things I have done for the state or anybody else, and that was Wahanesia, and that means children or defined as sacred being, because I want that, that word to stick out in people's minds. I want them to hear that word out of all the other words that I have spoken and focus on it. 